Well, thank you everyone for your attention and may I present Dr. Gary Bogan. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. Hello, everybody. It uh, would be nice to be in person, uh, but it's not quite uh, able to be done today, but uh, we'll hopefully do that in the future. So as an opening point, I'm a gastroenterologist and an internist. Uh, I've been doing it for a long time, even more years than I'm willing to admit. Um, and I did give a similar talk to the one you're going to hear today um, to the community a couple of years ago, right before COVID, in person, which was nice. And what I, I told them then is what I'll tell you now. And that this talk was one that I also gave as in part of grand rounds to the hospital to general internist practitioners, uh, general practitioners of the hospital. So it's not a specialist talk; it's a general medical talk. And I find when I talk to my patients, I try to talk to them at that level rather than below that level and uh, try to interpret uh, terms that are a little onerous. And if there's a term that you don't understand, don't worry about it because I'll either explain it or it won't be that relevant or it'll be repeated at, at some time. But I think you get a lot more out of it rather than you know trying to give you a very, very basic talk. And I, I, I don't like to do that. So, um, so we're going to be talking about GERD today, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And um, in order to understand things, you have to be able to distinguish between GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and GER, G-E-R, gastroesophageal reflux. And as you see on the slide in, in the diagram that's there, that this is the effortless movement of gastric contents from stomach into the esophagus. It's not a disease, but it's a normal physiologic process. You can see in the stomach that you have the hydrochloric acid, which is the main culprit, but pepsin, which is an enzyme produced in the stomach also causes problems. And then from the pancreas and the lower, the second portion of the duodenum moving back into the stomach, uh, you have bile and pancreatic enzymes. So you could have both an acidic irritation or even a alkaline irritation through these enzymes and bile. We don't talk too much about the latter, but it is a factor sometimes in resistant cases. But most of the culprit is the one you see at the top, HCl, hydrochloric acid. So that's GER, and if it's and it's it's basically a normal physiologic process unless it is present for more than 4% of the time for 24 hours. And the way we tell that is we can slip a little probe um, just above the junction between the stomach and the esophagus and measure things for 24 hours. And if, if the acid levels by the pH being lowered uh, to less than four uh, occurs more than 4% of per 24 hours, you go from GER, normal process, to GERD, which is a disease, gastroesophageal reflux disease, okay? So how do we prevent people from getting into trouble? How, what, what's in our body that prevents this reflux of acid from the stomach into the esophagus? Well, it's basically a three-tiered system as you see in the slide. The first is the anti-reflux barrier, the lower esophageal sphincter, right where you see, uh, I don't have a pointer, but between the stomach uh, and the esophagus, um, right at that point is a, about an inch of thickened lining in the lower esophagus that is a sphincter, just like your rectal sphincter, anal sphincter, this is a esophageal sphincter. And what it does is it, it's very clever, it's very smart, and it allows food to go through, but prevents acid from and bile from coming back up. Uh, and that's the major defect. The major defect is that there's dysfunction to that sphincter, but unfortunately to date, we don't have a single medication that takes care of it. So what we do is do the next best thing is if we're not gonna be able to retrain the sphincter and people who have this problem, we're gonna decrease the amount of um, irritating material coming from the stomach into the esophagus, so the bile and particularly the acid. So that's, that's the idea of it. So that's your, your first point of, 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 of resistance is the anti-reflex barrier, the LES, lower esophageal sphincter. The second is the esophageal clearance mechanisms. And the third is the, just the, the resistance of the tissue. Back to the middle one. So the esophageal acid clearance mechanisms, are very interesting. There are three of them actually. One is the salivation. You know, that's the alkali material that your saliva has that when you start to eat, you salivate. And then as you swallow that alkaline saliva, uh, the peristalsis and just the upright position of the body, uh, peristalsis occurs, that's a muscular contraction going down the esophagus uh, by virtue of the swallow. Uh, and then just being upright, the material, the saliva goes down the esophagus into the stomach. 
Um, and that then serves as a very important clearing process for acid that's been refluxed from the stomach back into the esophagus. Just as a point of reference, so if you remember some of the uh, Charles Dickens pictures of the, the small fat people with, uh, with, who were foaming at the mouth, that, 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 that process is called water brash. Those are people that have severe reflux. They didn't have any good drugs at that time. And so they just foamed at the mouth. And that was the alkali secretions trying to get into the stomach to neutralize the acid that was there, just as a point of historic reference. So those are the three mechanisms. And that's, those are very effective uh, walking around and doing what you're doing. However, when you go to sleep at night and lie down, all three of these mechanisms are lost. So at this point, you no longer salivate while you're sleeping, you are no longer upright, and you no longer swallow. So a lot of damage occurs at night. In fact, most of the damage occurs at night. You may get some heartburn during the day, but you don't know the heartburn you get at night because you're asleep. And a lot of people who say, gee, I don't have that much heartburn. I have so, many, so much in the way of disease and dysfunction. What's going on here? It's because things are happening at night. So knowing that and knowing the nighttime is dangerous, that part of our therapeutic approach to this is to deal with this loss of clearance mechanisms that occur at night. So um, when you look at the um, uh, pathophysiology, meaning uh, the process, the pathologic process that produces the disease of GERD, it's complex um, and it um, basically um, is a result from an imbalance uh, between defensive factors that we talked about, protecting the esophagus, what we just mentioned, and aggressive factors from the stomach contents, the gastric acidity, the volume, and the duodenal contents refluxing into the stomach, but mostly gastric material going into the esophagus. Uh, the intermittent nature of the symptoms and, uh, um, and esophagitis itself suggests that the aggressive and defensive forces are in a very delicate balance between each other and uh, a little shift in the wrong direction and you get in trouble. It's not an infrequent problem. It occurs monthly in a lot of people, uh, as you see here, and daily, and not an insignificant number. These are old figures, and I'm sure it's much higher now, since uh, part of the problem is as we gain weight and put more pressure on the stomach and get more reflux, uh, we get more esophagitis and uh, GERD. And we know that we have an expanding population in terms of weight. So these numbers um, probably would be adjusted upward. It also has an impact on a psychologic uh, good bearing and, uh, and it fits in with other diseases that do the same. So what are the symptoms of GERD? Uh, well, the two major symptoms are heartburn and regurgitation. So heartburn is not burning of the heart, of course. It's a retrosternal behind the breastbone discomfort or burning sensation which arises sometimes in the epigastrin. That's right below the xiphoid process, right at the top, the pit of your stomach right there. And it moves upward from that point and it can go all the way to the jaw. Um, and the discomfort is relieved by either just ingesting water or taking antacids like Maalox and Jellyosil and some of these others or Tums. Um, and that's heartburn. Now regurgitation is the GER. So the regurgitation is that effortless return uh, of a esophageal and or gastric contents into the pharynx, into the mouth, without nausea or retching. It's sour, it's burning fluid, and it may contain some undigested food materials. Uh, less common symptoms are on the next slide, and that's chest pain, uh, which uh, is similar to heart pain. So it's a pressure-like sensation uh, in the mid-chest area. So sometimes instead of getting burning as heartburn, you could get spasm of the, of the esophagus as uh, the manifestation, and that spasm in the esophagus simulates the same kind of pain that you get from heart disease, from a heart attack uh, or angina. And therefore, you're in a, a bind when that occurs, when you are a, instead of getting a heartburn manifestation, you get a chest pain manifestation because you can't tell the difference. So what we tell our general practitioners is that before we start working up the esophagus, you got to work up the heart. Because if the heart is the problem, that comes first. If it's the esophagus, we'll deal with that after. Now, another little uh, thing, um, I shouldn't have this recorded, but I'll tell you what I tell my patients. Um, so let's say, as we all have at some point, in the middle of the night, we get um, some chest discomfort because maybe we ate something we shouldn't have, too late, whatever, whatever, and we got this pain and we're saying, oh my, is this, 
do I have something, is this the big one or is this just a little heartburn? So what I tell my patients is do three, up to three things. The first thing to do is grab a glass of water or if you have some antacids around, take a couple of big tums or whatever and swallow them. Feel it go down and if the pain is at least significantly altered or relieved, then we know that's esophageal reflux done. If that doesn't work, then take your fingers and feel right at the junction between the ribs and the sternum, the breastbone, and see if you can manipulate the pain. Find an area of tenderness that simulates the pain. And if that's the case, then that's costochondritis, you know, and that comes from lifting the wrong way and then heat and some uh, anti-inflammatory will help a lot, but it'll, you'll know that this isn't your heart because you can't push on your heart. If A and B are not present or not positive, then C is uh, take a couple of aspirin, whatever you have, baby aspirin, whatever, make a paste of them, swallow them and call 911 because now you have a cardiac issue until proven otherwise. Just a little side piece. We won't, we'll, we'll say this is what I tell my patients. We won't go any further than that. And the fourth symptom of GERD is dysphagia, difficulty in swallowing. This only occurs in a, in a minority of patients with, uh, uh, with GERD. And it's probably in most cases when it's not due to narrowing stricture from inflammation, it's just due to spasm. Um, and um, if it's due to a stricture, in order for you to feel dysphagia, difficulty in swallowing, a slowing of the food process going from the esophagus into the stomach, the size of the diameter of the esophagus has to be restricted to 1.3 centimeters, which is uh, basically a half an inch. And um, that's the problem because that's why esophageal cancer is so deadly because in order to feel that main symptom of esophageal cancer, which is also dysphagia, difficulty in swallowing, you have to have that amount of narrowing, almost a 50% narrowing before you'll have any symptoms. Odynophage is painful swallowing, and that can occur from herpes or fungal infections or certain pills like potassium chloride anti-inflammatories like Motrin, certain antibiotics um, uh, like tetracycline in particular, quinidine and bisphosphonates, that's Fosmax. That's why I always take Fosmax a half hour before everything else, because it can be very irritating to the esophagus. You drink water, wait 30 minutes before you eat, okay? Um, so what are the diagnostic studies? How do we tell whether someone has esophageal inflammation and then how much, mild, moderate, severe? Well, the most important single feature is the uh, endoscopy. The, uh, that's the EGD, esophago, gastro, um, and that or upper endoscope, short. Uh, and that's a flexible fiber optic tube with light at the end of it that I'll show you a picture of in a second, at least a diagram. And uh, the indications for that are persistent symptoms. You don't do that the first time you get heartburn, but if you get heartburn and it doesn't go away, it persists, and we'll be talking about how we treat this in a moment, um, then um, it's at that point um, that you would go to a gastroenterologist via a, a consultation from your general pr practitioner for an evaluation, which most likely would uh, uh, include an, an endoscopy, upper endoscopy, as opposed to a lower endoscopy, which is a colonoscopy. The other thing you could do is do a x-ray, a barium swallow. We usually use that only if you have dysphagia difficulty in swallowing because uh, we'd like to see where the holdup is. And remember 1.3 centimeters is the narrowing point. So we have a tablet that's that size. And if that gets stuck at a point that identifies that you have, uh, that's the cause of your difficulty in swallowing and where it is in the esophagus. So it's a very helpful thing in a limited number, limited number of uh, situations. So that's the endoscope. Um, when I was gave my talk, I brought an endoscope and people could play with it a little bit and look at it. Can't do that today. Um, this per The only thing wrong with this picture is his eyes are open and his eyes should be closed because he's sedated. He's supposed to be sedated if our anesthesiologist is doing the right thing. So we use propofol mostly these days. We started with um, lesser levels of ice sedation, but propofol is safe. Uh, Diprovan is the drug and it's quick. Um, and anybody who's had an endoscopy, it's, uh, it's very nice because there's very little after effects. So on the right-hand side, you see the endoscope. You look through the, the end of it, you can see into the esophagus, the stomach, and even the upper duodenum. You can manipulate with this hand the side pieces that um, will allow the scope to go up and down. Uh, and as you see, you can take a biopsy of any portion of an ulcer uh, or the lining of the stomach, or in this case, the lining of the esophagus to see if there's significant esophagitis or rule out tumor. 
So this is what a normal esophagus looks like, sort of salmon pink color, very, um, looks very uh, calm. And uh, you're looking straight down from probably the mid esophagus toward the end. This is what happens when you get GERD. Uh, you, you start to see irregular redness that's called erythema. And in between that was white areas are um, superficial exudates, which is an inflammatory reaction to the uh, irritation from the, from the acid that's come into the esophagus. And this is a rather advanced case. So sometimes you see just a little bit, sometimes you see almost nothing and you have to still take biopsies because there's discordance between what you see and what the biopsies are. So usually biopsies are always uh, obtained or should be obtained when you're evaluating GERD. This is a case where it's pretty obvious. Uh, uh, and then uh, this is what the biopsy looks like. And you see the slide on the right uh, shows a thinner lining. There's inflammatory cells there. So this is a, this is a situation that really gets into the cellular uh, structure of the esophagus. Now this is a picture of Barrett's esophagus and it's worth mentioning. So it turns out that uh, in individuals, some individuals who have persistent reflux, uh, the body tries to adapt to the irritation by moving the stomach lining, the gastric lining into the esophagus. Sounds like a good idea because the stomach lining is much more resistant to acid than the esophageal lining, which is much thinner. However, whenever you move uh, a normal lining from, a, from its origin, original area into a new area, it usually renders that tissue neoplastic or potentially to become neoplastic. And that's the case with Barrett's esophagus. By the way, Barrett's is the name given to this disease entity because uh, Dr. Barrett was a surgeon who discovered this many years ago. So Barrett's esophagus is this uh, upward migration of the um, gastric lining, the darker red lining into the esophagus and taking over and displacing some of the pale esophageal lining that you see there. And it's pre-malignant. And in the worst case scenario, sorry to show you this picture, you get esophageal cancer, which is a very angry uh, 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 situation. And the numbers are this, that you know, if you take people that have heartburn, only about 40% of those people, when you under, subject them to endoscopy, will have actual inflammation. The others have spasm and other things, but 40, 50%, half of them will have inflammation. If you take 100 people with GERD, with gastroesophageal reflux disease, 10% of those will end up with Barrett's if they're not treated, 10 out of 100. If you take 100 Barrett's patients, 10 will end up with esophageal cancer. Or to the beginning, one out of 100 who had significant inflammation of the esophagus at time of endoscopy will end up with esophageal cancer if they're not treated. So this is something worthwhile to do. Um, so let's now move on to the treatment phase of things. And so there's the non-pharmacologic uh, and there's the pharmacologic portion of things. And uh, let's start with the easier part. So what can you do uh, without taking medications to decrease your um, propensity to get, uh, to go from GER to GER? Well, first thing you can do is uh, a lot of people are overweight. Uh, and weight reduction helps. Just it's a very simplistic concept of you have pressure on the on the stomach, and as you have less pressure on the stomach, you have less propensity to reflux up. Smoking opens up the lower esophageal sphincter, so stopping smoking for a lot of reasons is a good idea. Uh, stopping excessive alcohol consumption is also important for the same reason it does produce some acid, and then reducing dietary fat and meal size is important. So you know you have the stomach. Uh, and the food and, the, and acid can either go down to the small intestine and out or up to the esophagus. Well, it all depends on the um, uh, rapidity of gastric emptying. And gastric emptying is primarily influenced by two factors, the amount of fat in a meal and the size of the meal. The larger the meal, the slower the emptying, the more propensity to reflux. The more fat in the meal, the more likely is that you'll have less emptying and more reflux. That's why if you eat a, go to Thrasher's and have a, a cup full of uh, French fries, you'll start belching because your stomach will start empty, stop emptying, you'll swallow that air and bring it back up. So you want to, as a strategic position uh, with your diet, is to decrease the fat and decrease the meal size. Now, since we told you before that everything that really is bad mostly occurs at night, 
So you want to have some strategy uh, uh, to uh, prevent that from happening. So there are two strategies. The first is to elevate the head of the bed six inches. And you've heard people say, take an extra pillow. Problem with that is you jackknife your body at the waist and sometimes you cut off your gastric emptying. And so that doesn't work that well. A wedge would work very nicely. If you have a bed that you can put a six, six, inch, six inch block on in, then I would do that. A lot of these bed stores, mattress stores have that. Uh, and where possible, that's the best thing to do. But next would be to put, have a wedge. And the second thing is allow enough time for your stomach to empty, which is three to four hours. I'd say four. And if you feel that you ha you're pushing it and you had a larger meal than normal and it's barely four hours, sleep on your left side. So that's a little nice little piece of information to take away that whenever you feel like you've eaten too much and you feel a little full and you don't hope nothing happens that night, you're not going to be awakened, sleep on your left side. It encourages gastric emptying because of the position of the esophagus to the stomach. Okay. Um, so avoid uh, certain foods. So you want to avoid ca coffee, caffeinated products. And interestingly, it's not just caffeine coffee, it's decaf coffee as well. Now, decaf coffee has one-fifth the equivalent of acid-producing qualities as caffeine, but in a very sensitive person or a person we're trying to heal, they should be off both. And, but if you're going to start with something as you're getting better, start with decaf, of course. Tea, uh, cola has, and tea are next in line in terms of the amount of acid production and the amount of caffeine they have, and chocolate is the least. So, you know, a little bit of chocolate's not going to make the difference here. It's the cup of coffee that does it. Um, and a lot of colas. And by the way, it's just not caffeinated colas, it's any carbonated beverage, because those bubbles, whatever they are, rise to the top of the stomach and open up that sphincter and promote reflux. So even decaffeinated colas and other drinks of that nature are important. Carminatives that are used for digestion, interestingly, like spearmint and peppermint, open up the lower esophageal sphincter and can be a problem. And so you get a lot of heartburn from that. And then there's the, I'm, always, I'm often asked, uh, so is it okay, doctor, to have, uh, to drink citrus juice? And because every time I have it, I seem to feel bad. And what does that mean? Well, the distinction here is between a symptom effect of what you already have and something that produces that problem. And, and it turns out that the acid in your stomach, uh, for those that remember high school chemistry or beyond, uh, is about 0.1 normal hydrochloric acid. If you take a little drop of that, put it on your hand, it'll actually, you'll feel a little burning coming in. It's, that's irritating. That's the, it's amazing that our bodies uh, don't auto-digest themselves. And there's a whole discussion around why that doesn't happen, not for this talk. But if you take the uh, acid concentration of citrus fruit juices or tomato juice, it's not 0 0.1, 0 0.01, one one hundredth the difference. So. If you drink uh, grapefruit juice or uh, orange juice and you get you feel a irritation from there, it isn't causing that problem. It's identifying that problem. It's just an irritation. It's like scratching your hand with an open sore against the wall. Um, so it doesn't inhibit the uh, healing, but it will make you uncomfortable. So it's not the worst thing in the world. But as soon as that heals, you can have those things. Those are not the things that cause the problem. The things that cause the problems are what's above that we just talked about, the caffeine, the, the pepper and those kinds of things. Um, also, avoid those drugs that affect gastric emptying. And those are the anticholinergics, like, like Bentol and some of the drugs that we used to use a lot of, theophylline, diazepam's Valium, the narcotics inhibit gastric emptying, the um, amlodipine and other calcium ch uh, channel blockers that are used for hypertension may cause the problem and the others as you have listed. So those, these then complete the lifestyle modifications. It's diet, it's position, uh, it's avoidance of things that are over the counter. Okay, so let's move now on to the pharmacologic management of GERD. Um, and in order to have a discussion around this, uh, I'm going just to spend a moment on the slide. So this is a, a, a cartoon of a parietal cell. Parietal cells are in the upper half of the stomach and they are the cells that produce acid. And you see the slide on the left is in a resting state. There's no food being ingested. And you see these little canaliculi and these little tubules that are there and everything looks quiet. When you start to go into the eating process, these cells go from resting state to the, what you see on the right to a stimulated state. And if you look at the bottom of that parietal cell, you'll see 
three little um, uh, irregularities there, gastrin, ACH, and histamine. So these are the three stimulants that produce acid, which you see in the center of the cell, HCl, hydrochloric acid. These cells produce one-tenth normal hydrochloric acid. This is where the hydrochloric acid comes from, the parietal cells in the upper half of the stomach. So uh, gastrin is a hormone that's elicited from the lower part of the stomach, and it's in what's called a negative feedback system. If the body, if the stomach perceives there's not much acid present, then the cells in the lower part of the stomach stimulate gastrin, which then comes up through the, through the bloodstream and stimulates these parietal cells to produce some acid. So gastrin is one stimulant. The second is ACH, is acetylcholine, and that's the vagus nerve, and that's Pavlov's dog. So when you start to think about food or you smell food or you're getting hungry and you, you're starting to get some salivation and all the things that Pavlov's dog did, that's the stimulation of the vagus nerve and the activation of the ACH uh, uh, receptor. And that will also stimulate acid. So it's preparing the body to deal with the food that's about to be eaten. And then the third one to the right is histamine. And that's the one we're gonna concentrate on now. So histamine comes from cells, not important, endochromaffin cells. Um, and it is important that histamine is very similar to the histamine that you get from um, uh, allergic phenomena. So some people know, recognize that in high allergic seasons like the spring and the fall, that um, they get more acid problems. And that's probably because they stimulate both the um, uh, allergic stimuli of histamine as well as these particular cells. So one, two, three, three ways to stimulate the, the um, uh, parietal cell. So the first set of drugs are drugs that are called H2 or H receptor antagonists, uh, R, uh, H2RA. So that's like, if you look at the histamine to the right, uh, that's the one that's being blocked. That these cells, and they're mainly the cell, the, the drugs that we that you would know about are Pepsid and Zantac. These are the H2 receptor antagonists. They block that histamine. So you see, just so you know, they only block one of the three. So they're not, they don't turn off the whole cell. So these medications then um, that block the uh, receptor sites result in about a third reduction in acid secretion. The good news about them is that they're very rapid on, in, in action. They take them and 30 minutes later, they work. So if you're forced to eat a large meal at night that you know you shouldn't have and you're really feeling lousy and you wanna take something, the drug to take is either an antacid, if that will work, or one of these H2 receptor antagonists, Pepsid or Zantac, because they work right away, they don't work. The bad news is that, they, that about half the people that take them on a regular basis develop tolerance, so it doesn't work. And unfortunately, you don't know when it doesn't work. So you're not sure if it's too much bad food or not enough medication. So it has its place. It was the first drug to come out. It came out about 10 years before the next drugs we're going to talk about, the Nexium Prilosec drugs, the PPIs. It came out about 10 years before. And I remember going over to the NIH and while this drug was being tested in the 80s and early 90s and getting a handful of Pepsid or Zantac equivalent and taking them to my patients. And that was the first thing they had after antacids. And it was like this miracle drug. Little did we know that this was going to be the weak sister to the real drug that was coming along very soon. So again, it's useful in mild disease. Uh, the drugs are seen there, and the main ones are um, uh, Zantac and, uh, and Pepsid. And Zantac dosage is about 150 milligrams twice a day if you're going to maintain it, but 150 milligrams as necessary, PRN. Uh, for um, Pepsid, it's mostly 40 milligrams twice a day or PRN. Okay, back to the uh, cell that we are looking at, the parietal cell. So now on the right, we've done, we've looked at the stimulants, we've looked at histamine, we look, we're looking at the difference between a resting cell and a cell and a cell that's been activated by food ingestion or thinking of food. And if you look to the top of the cell, you see these little prongs on both sides. And those prongs are proton pumps. So the HCl that's produced within the cell, HCl, the H, the hydrogen ions, migrate to these prongs on both sides. So hydrogen is a positive ion, and so it's called a proton, okay? So these pumps that you see here are proton or hydrogen pumps. 
So those are the proton pumps. And they occur as you start to eat and are maximized at around 30 minutes after you start, after you start to eat. So they fill this, this area. And then what happens is they are released from the uh, cell, from these pumps, and they go into the stomach cavity itself and help um, uh, reduce uh, the acid that is present uh, in, in the stomach. And so these thing, these particular medications can't be taken any time. They got to be taken before a meal. That's very important. And these are the five proton pump inhibitors that are currently uh, being used. Um, Omeprazole was the first, Prilosec. Uh, the last, Esomeprazole, is basically an optical isomer or a sister drug of Omeprazole. It's Esomeprazole, considerably more potent than Prilosec, Nexium is, without any increase in side effects. So for many people, it's the drug of choice, but there are others there. And I would say the big three would be um, Omeprazole, uh, Prilosec, Pantoprazole, Protonix, and Esomeprazole, uh, which is Nexium. And you see the dosings for each of those. It's really, for Nexium, 40 milligrams. Uh, for uh, Omeprazole, it says 20, but it could be 20 to 40. And for uh, Protonix, it would be 40 as well. So um, the question is, how are these drugs prescribed? And if, if you look at um, some of the prescriptions, you'll find that physicians, unfortunately, just often prescribe, you know, one daily, as opposed to what they should say, which is one pill when? Is it before any meal, before breakfast, before dinner, before bedtime, or does it really matter? Well, it does matter. And um, it really matters most before breakfast. Now, you wouldn't know that, but you would think from what we just said, that it should be taken before a meal. And uh, if we go back to the slide, and let's just um, look at um, the dosings of this, you see that you want to take this pill about 30 to 60 minutes before you actually eat. And the reason for that is it's like a missile either hitting its target or missing it. You eat your meal or you think about your meal, you eat your meal, you activate your parietal cells, you produce hydrogen ions, they go to the proton pumps and they get released within 30 minutes after a meal. Well, it takes at least 30 minutes to get some any drug into the body so that if you take the pill when you sit down to eat or after you finish, uh, by the time that pill gets absorbed, goes around the system and is able to attach to these proton pumps, you miss, it's like a missile missing its target. So these drugs are called them PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, because they inhibit the release of hydrogen ions from the proton pumps. PPIs, okay? And the best time to give them is 30 to 60 minutes before the meals. Ideally, it's 30 minutes. If you tell someone they have to take a pill 30 minutes before a meal, before breakfast, because, and the reason, by the way, it's before, it can be taken before any meal, best before breakfast, because you produce the most proton pumps after a fast. So that's usually breakfast. And so given before breakfast is fine. The next time to be given is if you're taking it twice a day for certain situations, you take it before breakfast or dinner. Um, but if you tell someone to take it exactly 30 minutes before they eat, uh, they go nuts sometimes and it just doesn't work. And it's better to give a range. And so the range is 30 to 60 minutes. That will, that will work and it allows for um, maximum uh, activity of the proton pump inhibitor. Um, so there you have uh, how to take it and when to take it. And then if let's say you're taking this pill once a day um, or um, twice a day, and I'll talk about that in a second, um, the, uh, you want to um, uh, certainly, uh, if you need an additional amount of medication, let's say you're taking it before breakfast, you aren't yet taking it before dinner, you go out for dinner, you've you're had a big meal that you didn't expect, what do you do? You can't then take a proton pump inhibitor because that has to be taken before the meal, but that's where the H2RA like Pepsid and Zantac would work fine. Take that as an as necessary drug. Now there is another aspect of, of, next, of these uh, proton pump inhibitor drugs that need to be mentioned. And that is that if you take one a day before breakfast, as most people do, that there'll be a certain breakthrough in the middle of the night where you'll start to feel some symptoms in some people. That's called NAB or nocturnal acid breakthrough. And those people that experience waking up at 2, 3, or 4 a.m. in the morning with discomfort, 
need to be double dosed with a second medic, a second proton pump inhibitor 30 to 60 minutes before dinner. So the drug can be taken either once a day, if once a day, always before breakfast, or twice a day before breakfast and dinner. And if you need something else as a supplement for the reasons I just mentioned, that's where the H2RAs are, are very useful. Okay, I think I've covered what I wanted to there. So I want, in closing here, I wanted to talk about um, a, a subject that I know most of you have been exposed to. And it's a complex thing, and I'm going to try to simplify it, but at least give you a little feeling of this. So this is slide the camera. The gastro journals that showed all of the side effects that had been reported with proton pump inhibitors. You see just about everything there, brain, heart, liver, bone, osteoporosis, you name it, it's there. And, um, and it was very perplexing because when they did the original studies uh, back in 2000, they did a, a very rigorous study and they found virtually no side effects. Um, and here we are 20 years later and all of a sudden we're seeing reports of every other week there was something else. And I used to hear a lot of calls from physicians saying, my patients are driving me crazy. They're calling and saying, I'm on this drug for the last five years and I hear I can get brain disease or I hear I can get osteoporosis or whatever. What do I do? So that was, that's how I named my talk. What do I do you know, when a patient calls? So the answer to this question is complex. Calculated through the, through the papers and not through medical journals that there are side effects associated with these drugs. So, so what happened? What's the difference? So what, so then what's the, what's the explanation there? Uh, why, why, how did we, were we that wrong back in 2000 that all those RCTs uh, gave false information or are we wrong now that these observational studies are giving false information? And the difference, you know, is quite, quite, quite significant because in order to do a RCT, you have to, you know, good number of patients, uh, randomized controlled trials, you have to have a placebo group, you have to blind the patients and the investigators taking care of them to who gets what, and you have to carry it out until the statisticians say you've done enough of a, of a study to show a statistically significant difference that they calculate out, it's called chi-square, and that's a half a billion dollars to do that. Today, if you do a randomized controlled trial to get a drug, which the FDA requires to, have to be done in order for you to get a drug approved unless it's being accelerated for other reasons, um, and when they did that, the results were that the, the, um, the therapy for ulcer disease just was fantastic. We stopped doing ulcer operations, it changed everything and it really worked. And the side effect profile, and I remember seeing this was, uh, quote, essentially no different than placebo. So how do you go from that kind of situation to the today when every other week you come up with another article that says um, uh, proton pump inhibitors associated with osteoporosis or with cardiac disease? Um, and, and the answer to that is that these new studies are being done as an observational study as opposed to an RCT, the very laborious, expensive initial studies that were done. So what's an observational study? An observational study is that you take two groups of patients uh, that you're trying to look at and see if on a computer you can see differences. So in this case, they say, okay, let's look at all the people between the ages of 40 and 60 who take a proton pump inhibitor and let's compare them to another group of patients, 40 to 60, who don't take it, and let's see what comes out. Who are they? This? Do they have the same disease processes or not? This is through insurance claims and things like that. So you can get that information. And the answer is they're not the same. It turns out that in the group taking the proton pump inhibitors, there's more heart disease, more lung disease, more osteoporosis, and on and on and on. And so they then don't send these to journals because journals are very particular about how data is derived, but more likely to, to magazines or to newspapers who are very happy to get something that might uh, perk up their, their circulation. And, you know, next to statins, proton pump inhibitors are the second leading prescribed drug in the world. So you get a lot of traction if you have something with a proton pump inhibitor. And so they'll report something like a recent study demonstrated that taking, um, prior, taking a proton pump inhibitor is associated with an increased incidence of heart disease or osteoporosis. And, um, 
and then they stop. And what they should say, which they don't, is the next sentence should be, however, this does not prove causality. To prove causality, you must do a randomized control trial. Well, if they did that, they either wouldn't sell the paper or people wouldn't understand what was being said. So they don't do that. But that's the issue, is that an observational study is nice to look at things that might happen to a group of people taking them. But when you try to compare that to people not taking it, to get a control group, you have to go back to a randomized control trial. Because otherwise, the statisticians would tell you there's all kinds of bias. Now, the types of bias that occur in an observational study is uh, well beyond all of us. And, you know, eyes glaze over when you start talking about it. But I will uh, say to you that there is one uh, type of bias that was published in JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, in 2009, which talked about channeling bias. And basically what they said is what happened. It is the explanation basically for all of the things that have occurred here. And that is that you're making an incorrect assumption when you say that I'm going to take uh, two groups of patients, 40 to 60, those taken PPIs and those not taking PPIs, and they're the same people except for the fact they're taking the people except for the fact they're taking PPIs. In fact, they're not the same. In fact, the people, if you can find a group of people this, with this commonly drug prescribed, if you can find an, a, an equal number of people between 40 and 60 not taking PPIs, they are generally healthier and have less disease. And what you're seeing here are that the people taking PPIs between 40 and 60 just have more disease. But it's that you cannot say that it's directly correlated to the PPI um, because you haven't done that type of study. And as observational studies are being done more and more because it's cheaper, much cheaper, uh, some of the statisticians are coming up with certain requirements. And there's a, a, a set of criteria called the Hill criteria that Hill was a statistician a few years ago, and he put up 10 requirements that an observational study has to have before uh, you can say that you have valid results. And I'll just give you the first three because they're real simple. The first one is biologic plausibility. It doesn't make sense that if you suppress acid with a PPI that you're going to get heart disease or brain disease or even osteoporosis. You know, calcium absorption does not depend upon acid. And so the answer is no, it doesn't happen. The second is, um, are all the studies consistent? Do each study show the same thing? Because if you have a real thing scientifically, one study should be, can't be yes and the next no. Well, the answer is if you look across the board, there are all kinds of ups and downs in terms of results. And the third one is their dose dependency. If you take the drug and take one pill versus two pills and you see, uh, or half a pill, is there a gradation of increased complications associated with increased dosage? And the answer is no. So on the first three of the Hill criteria, these all fail. And they fail because of channeling bias. They fail because that these people, you're not, you're not measuring the effect of PPIs. You're measuring what people who take PPIs have, and you're, and you're assuming that that's due to the PPI. And you can't do that without doing an RCT. So that's the end of my discussion. But, you know, it's a big deal because you know, if you go back to that slide there, that represents about 20 different magazine articles that have appeared or newspaper articles. And it really has caused a lot of angst uh, among the population, and frankly, among the doctors, because this explanation that I just gave you isn't as well known as it probably should be, or at least it isn't articulated. When I tell a patient like this, I looked at my watch and I say, I've just spent about 10 or 12 minutes explaining you know, channeling bias, and uh, it, it, but I do it because that's what you're supposed to do. But anyway, uh, just so you know, so uh, PPIs are good, they're safe. Now, on the other hand, they you know don't use them if you don't need them. Uh, once your condition has been healed, your ulcer, or once your GERD is healed, then you try to get off these drugs. And uh, if there's any silver lining to this misinformation that's happened is that it's identifying a lot of people who should question, do I really need to stay on the PPI? And that's a fair question. That's a question to ask your doctor. And if you don't need to stay on it, then don't, because you know what happens. So many people get on a drug and they never get off of it. Now, if you're on an antihypertensive, that's a different matter. But when you're taking a PPI for a particular problem, the problem is healed, then you have to have at least a discussion with your physician as to whether or not you should continue. And with that, I'll stop. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rogan. Wow, that was fascinating. Um, okay, we will open it up for questions. We have four 
right now, um, but keep them coming. Um, and again, you can please type your questions in the Q&A box at the very bottom of the screen. Um, okay, so our very first question is, if bile goes up into your system, can the bile cause the bile duct to get wider and flatter? The bile, the, the, the bile only, the bile duct, so bile comes from the liver, it's transmitted through the bile ducts to the gallbladder, stored and concentrated, water gets rid of, and then twice during each meal, the gallbladder contracts, the bile gets into the upper small intestine and participates in digestion. And if the bile goes up, that's called retrograde, rather than down, antegrade. If it goes back up, that just means that it's going the wrong way and causes some problems, but it has nothing to do with the diameter of the bile duct. The only thing that will, will enlarge the diameter of the bile duct is some obstruction like a stone. So if you had a, um, a common bile duct stone or even a, a gallbladder stone that got stuck before it empties into the second portion of the duodenum, then that back pressure will dilate the blood, the, the bile duct, and that can be seen on the CAT scan and some of these other studies that we do. Uh, but it's due to obstruction of the flow of bile from the liver to its emptying point in the second portion of the duodenum. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rogan. Um, our next question is, can you show normal Barrett's and esophagus and cancer slides a bit longer? Um, can I show them again? Here we go. Yes. Okay, so here, so here is normal um, uh, pink salmon esophagus. That's what it looks like. When it gets inflamed, you get these red uh, and white areas. The red represents erythema, dilated blood vessels from inflammation. The white uh, exudate. Um, it thins out the mucosa, the lining of the of the esophagus seen on the right. Barrett's is when that red area. Uh, is coming up from the stomach into the esophagus. So it migrates upward and replaces some of the pink salmon, just like we saw before. Um, uh, salmon, salmon again there on the left and up the upper right. And the dark red is the Barrett's. That's the gastric lining. So if you look, when you're doing an endoscopy, the esophagus looks like that salmon lighter color and the stomach looks like the darker color. So, you, so you, you, we do biopsies for a lot of reasons that are beyond the scope of this talk because uh, things are graded in terms of intensity, but you can identify probable Barrett's by just looking at the esophagus before you take the biopsy. I mean, no one would miss this for high, high probability of Barrett's esophagus. We still take biopsies because we have to quantitate this and there's some other factors. Does that answer your question? Thank you, Dr. Rogan. And the same participant said this was the best explanation she's heard. So thank you. Um, thank you. Okay, next question is, is it better to take omeprazole closer to 30 or 60 minute window? 30. In other words, if you play it out what we just said, if you take that pill 30 minutes, it should arrive right into the uh, proton pump area to the parietal cells right on time. 30 minutes after you start eating, which is about the time that the proton pumps are fully activated and starting to release it. But the truth is you got a window. And so the window is 30 to 60 minutes, not two hours, not 120 minutes, and not two minutes. You don't want to take it right away because it'll be gone before you fully need it. 30 to 60 minutes is what we've all agreed upon. But if someone you know, wants to be precise about this, the answer is 30 minutes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, next we have, is a sensation of a lump in the throat related to GERD? That's called globus. Um, not generally. It's not a major symptom. It's more due uh, to inflammation in the pharynx and the back portion of it. It's not a GERD symptom. Um, let's see, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have a slide. Let me just, so if we had, had more time, I have a slide. Let me see if it stops at this point here. Um, yeah, here's the slide. All right, so this slide um, is another talk about the typical and atypical symptoms of uh, GERD. So on the left, you see the typical symptoms, heartburn and regurgitation, and you see different kinds, erosive, uh, different types. But look at the middle red group where you see atypical symptoms, uh, and then look at the complications. We've talked about the complications, cancer, strictures, Barrett's esophagus. If you go to the middle red, 
these are the things that can occur that you wouldn't normally first think of to be related to gastroesophageal reflux. ENT-wise, chronic cough, hoarseness, laryngitis, pharyngitis, a sore throat, and sinusitis. All those things conceivably could be precipitated by severe reflux, which goes up into the back of the mouth. Secondly, the second arrow is it can also exacerbate asthma, chronic bronchitis, and fibrosis. So some people who get worse with asthma you know, should be looked at after they've had optimal treatment as to whether or not they are also um, uh, prime candidates for GERD, particularly if they have the phenotype, overweight, bad eating habits, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, when the shoe fits, wear it. Um, and then even things, I've been sent patients who uh, are seen by the dentist for dental erosion. So when the erosions occur on the inner side of the incisors, the first thing to think about is nocturnal reflux, and that's happening at night. And we've actually had some cases where we were able to cure the erosions by maximally dosing. So Nexium twice a day, you know, bed up six inches, one year later, uh, erosion is gone. So it's not the only cause of erosions, but when you get into treatment resistance, it's certainly one of the things to remember. Um, it can cause chest pain, even though the typical symptom is heartburn in some people, fortunately the minority, they'll get spasm of the esophagus, as I mentioned before. When they get spasm of the esophagus, it's indistinguishable between heart pain and esophageal pain. You can't tell the difference. And, uh, and that pain, by the way, doesn't respond to the little thing I told you about taking a little antacid. When it's into spasm, you know, now the burden of proof is on uh, the emergency room to do the studies to be sure that your heart enzymes and your EKG are where they should be. Uh, it can certainly disturb sleep. Um, interestingly, uh, GERD at night, which is when a lot of it occurs, they've done sleep studies where some people have all kinds of retired in the morning. And what it turned out to be is that they're usually overweight people eating large fatty meals late at night. Okay, classic. And we know there's more than a few people that do that. That person goes to sleep all night long they're waking up for less than 20 seconds just to go upright enough to get the acid levels that are going into their throat back down into their stomach. And they're being videotaped on this. And there also is a pH monitor verifying that this is acid going up in the esophagus. And they do this all night long. And it turns out that these are called mini arousals. And if you're awake for less than 20 seconds to do this, which is often the case, you have no conscious recollection of this in the morning. But when you ask the patient in the morning, how'd you sleep last night? They say, fine. Uh, how do you feel? Tired. And they have no idea that they've been up, up and down all night long, protecting their airway from this nocturnal reflux uh, because of the situation. So uh, it could be a real problem. So that's the sleep disturbance that you see. So that gives you, those are the atypical symptoms. So, uh, you know, we simplify this by talking about heartburn and acid regurgitation, but like everything else in medicine, it's not that simple. And what you see on this slide uh, is a more, is a greater spectrum of the manifestations of GERD. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Rogan. That's interesting. Um, so we have about 10 more questions. Let me know if you're okay with timing, Dr. Rogan. Um, I'm and, okay. Okay, All perfect. Right. Um, next is what if uh, they don't have a gallbladder? Well, if you don't have a gallbladder, I mean, that's that doesn't have anything to do with this, but um, it, it does, you know, the gallbladder distorts the um, bile. And it turns out that um, surprisingly, there are very little effects in most patients, but not all, of uh, having a, a cholecystectomy, a gallbladder removal. Uh, you just can't store the bile and optimize it. You know, optimizing it means that you eat a meal and hormonal processes occur, which allow for two contractions to occur during the digestion of the meal. If you have your gallbladder out and the bile is coming from the liver and there's just a constant trickling of bile into the gut, so it isn't quite as optimal in terms of digestion, you're not concentrating the bile where you need it for digestion in the upper small intestinal tract, but um, it, it's amazing that it doesn't cause more problems, but it doesn't for most, most patients. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, next question is, I get hoarseness from time to time, especially when under stress and was told it came from acid reflux. What can I do? Well, you have to look to see what happens when that occurs and see if you can avoid it. Is it true? I mean, it could be true. 
and it could not be. Now, the ENT people, there, there's a complexity here that we can't go into, but um, I've given talks to the um, DC ENT Society about um, laryngeal reflex versus GERD and you know whether they're two separate diseases or not. And it's very difficult to uh, distinguish the two, but uh, suffice it to say that the ENT people think of GERD a slight, in a slightly different fashion. <clears throat> they think because when they do an upper endoscopy or whatever they do, they see a red larynx. They call that reflux laryngitis and say it's due to reflux. Well, I can only tell you that when I first started doing endoscopy, and sometimes I would do an uh, look at the esophagus, look at the stomach, and I'd see a bright red stomach, much brighter than what they're seeing, you know, in the larynx. And I would biopsy that, and they, it would come back normal. And it turned out that this is very just a superficial irritation due to a vitamin or some coating, but didn't cause any of the types of pathologic processes of inflammation that we're talking about here. Now, you can't biopsy the vocal cords. You can't biopsy the larynx. Um, and so that process and that concept has never been proven or disproven. So suffice it to say that redness doesn't equate to inflammation. And that's all they see there. However, um, if people are adequately treated for reflux, very often their laryngitis gets better just as their pharyngitis gets better. Both seem to respond the same way. That's the best I can say. And, and it, there's still a controversy out there on that. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, next question is, is there a connection between pounds and GERD? I do believe we've covered this, but yeah, quickly, is there? A... I'm sorry, uh, between what and GERD? Uh, pounds, I guess weight and GERD. Yeah, we, we covered that. that. The more you weigh, the more you're going to reflux. Excellent. So, you know, uh, because there's more pressure on the abdomen, which puts more pressure on the stomach, which puts more pressure on, instead of it going out of the stomach down, it goes out of the stomach up. And there's no question, I, and I have to say that I personal had personal experience with this. When I gained uh, at some point 10 or 15 pounds uh, some time ago, uh, I got more heartburn and, and I felt it. And as soon as I lost that weight, it went right away. So I can attest to that. <laughs> it's not uncommon. Perfect. Thank you. Next we have, is sensation a reliable indicator of improvement or worsening of condition or disease? So what do you mean sensation? I don't understand that. Um, I think they mean what, what you're feeling, any side effects that you feel on the forefront. Any side effects you feel on the what? Uh, like initially, um, any feelings of... Um, acid reflux. Um, I think that's what they mean. So uh, give it to me one more time. So is sensation a reliable indicator of improvement oh. or worsening of condition or diseases? Um, usually, yes. I mean, you know, you have to explain them. Mm -hmm. And uh, more often than not, they are. Um, you know, the question is, what else could the symptom be due to? So if you feel heartburn, um, could it be due to something other than acid reflux? Well, it could be due to emotionally induced spasm of the esophagus. So that's, you know, that could happen. Um, of course, it could be due to something other than the esophagus, like you're having some angial type symptoms. So, you know, that's, but, but generally, you know, there's a, there's a temporal relationship between eating, associated symptoms. It's a composite of things in which the single symptom is one piece of it. But when you look, the first thing that one should ask, as a physician should ask when they are presented with a symptom is, you know, um, what precipitates it? What relieves it? How long does it last? Where does it go? Those are four questions to a sensation and not just one. So as you, but by the time, if you do it right and the patient thinks about it correctly, you can often find out the answer without having to do much in the way of invasive testing most of the time. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and going back to a prior question, I believe I misspoke. Um, they meant, does IBS have any connection with GERD? No. I mean, IBS is a ubiquitous disease and you know we see a lot a lot of that but um it um there really isn't a relationship um uh, with that now is there a relationship between esophageal spasm that um you know has a psychogenic component in ibs maybe yes you know there are you know it's a good part of ibs is a motility disorder rather than organic disorder there's not actual um 
cellular destruction, there's more motility disturbances, motor things. And the same thing, the same kinds of disturbances can occur in the esophagus. So there is an answer to this that in some people who have IBS, mainly a motor type of a severe IBS, where they get spasms and all the rest, that uh, since the GI tract is, I conceptualize this as one continuous integrated system, some of these people will have diffuse esophageal spasm at the upper, upper end and all kinds of problems in between. In other words, their entire motility disturbance, uh, motility process, their, their uh, peristaltic process is affected, not just in the colon or not just in the stomach or in the esophagus. But that's unusual because we have so many good drugs that start to attack this and, you know, other uh, dietary considerations, very important in IBS, FODMAPs and all the rest that, you know, we don't have, when I first started, um, we had a lot of IBS and a lot of people that weren't happy. And I remember I was at Hopkins and there was one, uh, probably the only one in the country who was a full professor of psychiatry and gastroenterology. And I asked him that very question. Do people who have a lot of IBS, are they more prone to have esophageal disease? And he said, absolutely. It's one continuous um, organ, basically. That's never really been published to any great degree, but in my observations, my personal experience, I've seen that on occasion. Perfect. Thank you. Um, next question is, does GERD cause diarrhea and or vomiting? It does not cause diarrhea. Um, does it cause vomiting? Generally not. What was the third one? It was just those two. I'm sorry? Um, that was just it. Those two? Yeah, mm -hmm. no. The answer is those are not classic symptoms of either. Um, you know, it's uh, no. Okay, great. Uh, next question is, great talk. Was, wasn't there a time when you um, prescribed Nexium one day on, one day off? And what was the reason for that? Okay, so, yeah. So um, what I try to do is uh, go to the lowest possible dose. And I have found that because of the life the metabolism of the drug, that in about a good portion of my patients who are stable, uh, who you, know, you don't want to take off the drug because if you take them off the drug, they get in trouble. The first thing I try to do is go to every other day. And the way the metabolism of the drug allows for it to stay in place for 48 hours rather than just 24. Uh, now, they don't talk about that a lot. And there's not a lot of studies, but I've seen that in action. So I will have people that... Um, I reduced every other day. And then what I tell them is when they get into the high acid season, which I call the spring and the fall, uh, from maybe mid-August to the end of September and mid-March to the end of April, go back to your previous doses of one a day. And when they don't, they get in trouble. When they do, they do. This has not been published. Um, but I can tell you, I've seen it over and over again. I, a good number of my patients just do it automatically. I don't have to tell them. So, that, but you know, it's always nice to try to lower it, but could you go to every three days? No. Once you go to every three days, the metabolic action of the drug, you, it'll fall off the proton pump and you know, you're, not, you're not in equilibrium. So you, you got yourself a window of 24 hours. And so always less is better. If you can feel okay with every other day, do it every other day. Perfect. Um, great. Next question is, is it safe to take, for example, Protonix 40 milligrams for more than six months? Sure. Um, people take it sometimes it's safe to take for years as long as you're monitored. All right. So one last. So what's the monitoring here? So I talked about all the things that can't be attributed to uh, PPIs, all those observational studies, which were pretty much bogus. But there are several deficiencies that can occur when people, with people taking PPIs. And it doesn't mean you stop the PPI. It means that you replace the deficiency. So what are they? So there's just a couple. So the deficiencies are B12, which can occur, iron, which can occur, and magnesium. So a couple times a year on people on full dose PPIs, I check the magnesium, iron, and B12. And I do replace the magnesium or the iron B12 if they're deficient. I don't stop the drug, but I do observe those. So I, this business of putting people on drugs and say, I'll see you a year later, 
to me is not the way is not the best way to do this. I think you need to monitor this not every month, but a couple of times a year, just to be sure that they're not getting into one of these three elemental deficiencies. I'm glad that question was asked. I did not mention that. Excellent. Thank you. We have about eight to nine more questions just to give you a heads up. Uh, let me know again on timing. Um, okay, I'm good. The next question is, when taking a PPI to heal the esophagus, how do you know when the tissue is healed and when you can stop taking the medication? I, I think you have to go on symptoms. If you had symptoms to start and the symptoms are gone, then I think it's reasonable to do. You should do it in conjunction with your physician. You should not be doing this by yourself. Usually, average length of time for healing, significant esophagitis, six to eight weeks. Now, if you have some precipitating factors like you're not eating the right foods or you're overweight, you should be working on those simultaneously so that you're not just depending upon the drug. You know, a lot of people will cover up several ills by just taking the drug. The idea is since you don't want to be on any drug longer than you have to, is you should do some of the lifestyle modifications of losing weight, eating right, uh, uh, not eating before you go to sleep, et cetera, et cetera, as part of the process so that you can get down to the lowest dose that um, is um, effective. That's great to know. Um, okay, next question is, this person's doctor has prescribed alternating Pepsid two times a day and Omeprazole once a day. So every other day, one or the other. What does this approach tell you? Um, I, it's not an approach that I would use because they work by two different mechanisms. One significantly suppresses acid. The other is more like a PRN as necessary type thing. Here's the problem. The problem, I mean, so we have some people who are just, you know, just have major symptoms, hard to treat. So these people end up on double dose PPIs and um, uh, 30 to 60 minutes before breakfast and dinner and 40 milligrams of Pepsi that night. The problem is, if you remember that slide of the, pro of the issues with H2RAs, is that in tolerance can develop in a significant number. That number is 50%. And you don't know when that occurs and it doesn't occur. So you could be taking this drug and the effect that you're getting is totally due to the PPIs and you're taking an unnecessary drug. So for long-term effects, I just do not see the PPIs in any place. And um, there have been a couple of major symposia, symposia um, on that. And uh, the person who... Um, I, I respect the most in terms of this particular issue is a guy named Phil Katz, Dr. Katz from Penn. And I heard him make that statement. Uh, and I agree with that statement that at one time, you know, he made that statement because he had at one time advocated just what you just described. And he pulled back on that and said, because of, there's a, because of the 50% tolerance that develops where you lose effect, uh, it's not fair to have people do that because they will never know whether the drug is working or not. So I use it as a as necessary as a PRN drug. Okay, good to know. Um, next is a, just a quick request to go, please show the cancer slide again for a few seconds. Okay. okay. What's the answer? What's the question? Uh, there wasn't a question, I think she... Oh, you want to see it again? Yeah. So it's it's a it's a that's just a cancer that's really developed from the inner lining of the esophagus. That's an extreme version. Sometimes it's just a flat lesion. I have other pictures, uh, uh, but you know, you look at that, and there's no question what that is. It's going to be only one thing. Perfect. Um, great. Okay. Next question is: When should pepsis AC be taken? Fifteen minutes before eating. Um. So Pepsid, the, the drug, that's the HTRA, that can be taken um, anytime. No, it does not. It does not require to be taken before a meal. You can. The, the beauty of that of the HTRA is as a PRN medication, you can take it any time. So if let's say you eat at nine o'clock and at eleven o'clock you're starting to feel bad, and before you lie down and turn on your left side, you can take a, a good dose of Pepsid or Zantac at that moment. So there's no good time. It's unrelated. The only things that relate to food are the PPIs, 30 to 60 minutes before the meal. Perfect. Uh, next we have, what is the device to put under your bed? It's, a, it's just a wedge. Um, and if you go to these um, mattress stores or bed stores, 
Um, I've gone in a couple of times just to see if they have it, and they do. They'll have they'll either have a six inch block that you put under the headboard, one on either side, or the wedges that you put between the box springs and the mattress. The problem is if you just use a couple of pillows, think about it as you jackknife yourself a little bit, you, you're sort of bending at the waist. So in a way, you might be cutting off your gastric empty. You might be doing you know, just what you don't want to do. Now, a slight elevation, uh, you know, not an extreme elevation of the head is always a good idea. But, um, you know, if you've been eating late at night. But um, a, mu a, a more physiologic way to approach this matter is to get a wedge underneath between the box springs and the mattress or um, six inch blocks at the, at the headboard. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next we have, what is your opinion on Dexalene? I don't use it. Um, I think that, you know, it was a nice idea um, and uh, I don't see any advantages in it. And generally I don't see, there's some positions, you know, we all have our uh, things that we like whether and sometimes they're not necessarily scientifically based, but I certainly, I mean, frankly, I'll tell you. Um, so, if you look at the potency of drugs pharmacologically, all drugs are quantitated from a potency standpoint by something called the AUC, which is the area under the curve. And the higher the number, the more potent the drug. So, it's a dose response curve. And just to give you, these aren't exact numbers, but if you look at Prilosec, uh, Pentoprazole, and Nexium, uh, the AUC, relative AUCs would be 4, 8, and, tw uh, uh, four, eight and 12. So that um, Nexium is by far the most potent of these drugs, uh, considerably more than its, its, uh, its sister drug, Prilosec, and more than pentoprazole. The question is, is more better? Do you really need it? There's not, more is not more side effects, but clinically it does not appear that there's any study to show a significant difference, at least between pentoprazole and, and esomeprazole, which is Nexium. So um, I do run the PNT program at the hospital and we elected because of uh, economic uh, considerations to use pentoprazole as the drug of choice because we could not, identify enough evidence to support a higher cost of using Nexium. In my private practice, I see the differences to be negligible. I see the insurance companies not, for the most part, distinguishing. And so if I have my druthers, I use esomeprazole or Nexium. And by the way, um, the generic is every bit as good as the um, trade name. And any patient has the right to ask the pharmacist to give them generic of the drug in the state of Maryland. Good to know. Thank you. Um, okay, next we have, can chronic rhinitis induce GERD or mimic its, mimic its symptoms? Are you talking about rhinitis, R-H-I-N-I-T-I-S? Yes. Rhinitis, yes. no. Okay. No, mucus coming down doesn't do it. Okay, uh, we're down to our last three questions. Will Pepsid hurt every night long-term? Well, no, but it just may not work. You have a 50-50 chance of it not working. Um, and so uh, you might, you know, it depends what you're taking it for. You might try to get off of it. And by the way, when you experiment with decreasing your medication, don't do it in the spring and the fall, because there does seem to be a relationship between needing more rather than less. So again, in my experience, and this is not science, this is um, my personal experience, um, that uh, mid-August mid to end of September and mid-March to end of April are not times when you want to reduce your dosage. Oh, that's interesting. Um, great. All right. Next we have, if your belly has grown larger and feels hard versus soft when you push on it, does that contribute to heartburn? Sure. Anything that enlarges your belly um, is an issue, but whatever is making your stomach hard should be your abdomen hard. You should have checked out. Perfect. Um, okay. Last question is, does tolerance develop with PPIs? Does tolerance develop with PPIs? Thankfully, no. Ah. Ooh, good. With H2RAs, but not with the other. That's what makes this drug such an incredible drug. And that's why um, I took issue with all of these very superficial studies that were shortcuts to RCTs that scared people more than helped them. And uh, the only thing that came out of that that was positive as far as I was concerned is that it made everybody think, do I really need to take this drug? It's probably, you know, if it's a second leading 
prescribed drug in the world, and there's probably a significant number of people who don't need that drug. They needed it at one time. The need passed, and they're still taking it just because they're taking it. So, and by the way, you know, we know that as we get older, the average number of drugs is polypharmacy is huge, you know, eight to 10, and uh, a spring cleaning to go over these drugs with your practitioner on a one-by-one -one basis is a good idea because sometimes less is better. Excellent. It's a good, that's a good time point to stop on. What do you think of that? Oh, great. And actually, we have completed our Q&A. Those are all the questions we have. Uh, Dr. Brogan, that was an amazing presentation, very informative, and thank you for your time to thoroughly explain each question. Um, we hope to have you again in the future for another talk or maybe the same one. Um, uh, so right, my pleasure. Thank you all for attending. Appreciate your indulgence. Sorry for the audio visual. We're, we went through the last 24 hours. It's been crazy. As Sarah will attest uh, to finding ways to do this. But um, I usually do this from the hospital and there's one less hoop to have to jump through. But um, glad we could get it done. So have a good day, everybody. Agreed. Thank you, everyone. And remember to complete your evaluation, please. Thank you.